Okay, so hi again, it's Nancy, Sipping and Painting Hamden, and we're gonna paint this lovely painting called Picnic Spot. And you'll see that it has some, uh, it's a kind of Bob Ross looking scene, isn't it? It, it looks like maybe you found a place up in the mountains uh, that would be a nice spot to, to have a little picnic, it has some beautiful trees and some <clears throat> uh, a river or stream that kind of goes off in two different directions. The thing that's a little bit unusual about this painting is the original artist made these streaks of different colors in the background that are vertical rather than horizontal. That's a little unusual, um, so we're gonna go with it. You can either do that or not do that. Totally up to you. And I think what it's supposed to be suggesting are reflections, like ref rather reflected light um, through the forest. And sometimes when light is bouncing around in a, in a forest, it, it hits off of different trees and um, other things that are in, in the water. And it just makes this reflected uh, light in, in different shimmers around. So you can do a plain blue background. You can do these colors vertical, or pardon me, horizontally if you want for more of a sunset effect. Or you can do this up and down reflected light thing. I'm gonna go ahead and copy the original as close as I can, uh, but you need to do you because that's how you're gonna be happy. I want you to be happy with your painting. Remember, no one will ever see the original, so don't worry if yours doesn't look like mine. Mine is not gonna look exactly like the original um, because every time someone paints, it's a little bit different. So don't worry at all about that. All right, I think I'm gonna move this over a smidge. <clears throat> uh, okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do, oh, let me just tell you about my supplies. So I have five colors of paint. I have white, black, red, yellow, and blue. I also have a water jar. I have napkins. I have brushes in three sizes, your brushes, Probably don't look just like mine, but it doesn't really matter. Just use what you have. And uh, I think that's about it. I'm wearing an apron. Aprons are a good idea as well. Um, so we're gonna get started by picking up our big brush, putting it in water, and then just covering our whole canvas with water. And that'll take you a couple minutes. And the reason we do that is in a dry climate like where I am now in Denver, <clears throat> uh, the, can the paints dry out really quickly. So we wanna keep them from drying out too quickly by adding a little humidity to the canvas. And that's gonna help our paints stay smoother. They will dry out throughout the uh, painting. And every so often I might just add a couple of drops of water and stir that in to keep them thin. I like to keep my paint so that it's, it um, can spill. It's kind of like Hershey syrup. It's not thick like pudding. It's not thin like ink. It's somewhere in between. Um, and so if it starts to get hard on top and, and too thick, then I will add a little bit of water. So just a little bit of water all over on our canvas for the first step. And just make sure you get it all over. You don't have to do a second time if you want to do the one. That's okay. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to do our background first. We're going to do all these colors in the sky first. And so I'm going to, I want a light blue for a lot of it. So I'm gonna pick up my big brush on one side, I'm gonna put it in blue. On the other side, I'm gonna come off the side in the white. Don't go right into the middle of a color. Um, you wanna keep it as clean as you can. So I'll just go in from the side on the white. I have white on one side, I have blue on another. And that way, that's gonna help me streak with that. It's kind of like a cheater's way, not, not so much work. To have white on one side, blue on another. And I'm just gonna put some random blue streaks in my background. 
because I'm going to do this vertical color the way the original is. And she has quite a bit of blue in it. And then since that's a pretty blue blue, and I want to lighten it up a bit, I'm going to pick up some more water, pardon me, not water, some more white on my brush. And I'm going to go over some of those blue areas so a little lighter. My background's going to be mostly blue. I'm a little bit more of a realist painter than the original uh, uh, artist was in this. But you do you. You do you. You do what makes you happy. That's all that matters. And if at any time you have a question, uh, since this is on Zoom, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away. I'm going to do mostly blue and white on my background. And then I'll mix in some other colors lightly after I get, use all the paint that's on my brush. You'll notice that I also was putting paint on the top of the canvas. And I'm doing that because if I put paint on the top, then I won't have to get a frame. That's called a, oops, sorry, I bumped the camera. That's called a gallery wrap. And so what that means is that the painting is wrapped around the frame of the, what, the wood holding it together. And so then you don't have to put a frame on the outside because it's already got a finished edge. And that will save you loads of money. And it looks pretty modern too. If you like modern. If you don't, you can always go get it framed, but that's can be kind of see. Whatever you like. I'm not even going to clean my brush for the next step and I'll go ahead and do it but if you're still putting on blue and white don't worry I won't get too far ahead but I'll just show you for the next step I'm going to put white on one side and I'm going to go in with just a little bit of red on the other side white and red and now I'm going to streak in some other colors And I'm probably going to have to use quite a bit of white over that to tone it down because that is pretty bright. But if you like a really bright, bold sky, cool, keep it. It's just up to you, not me. I'm going to tone mine down a bit. You can also paint with water by just adding a little bit of water to your brush and going over what you've already done. Just make sure you knock off most of the water in your jar or cup so that you don't have drips. I think in this painting, since the lines are vertical, it wouldn't even matter if I did have drips because I just cover them with everything down below later. But general idea is you want to avoid drips when you can help it. And just take your time to worry with this. But I am picking up a little bit of water. It's so dry in Denver right now that I just keep picking up a little bit of water on my brush and the canvas is drinking it. I have a funny story about this painting. You want to hear it? So this is a, a nice painting. We do this all the time here. 
<clears throat> but it's obviously a summer painting. It has green grass and flowing river, no snow in the trees. And I had a client one time, a customer, who asked me to create a, a winter painting for her uh, for a private event. And so I didn't exactly know when, when she was going to come in and, and see it. And we had a bunch of uh, Christmas parties going on at the studio that week. And I hadn't gotten to her painting yet. And so she stopped in and said, oh, I wanted to see how my painting's coming along uh, for the, you know, for the private event we're going to do next week. And I thought, oh my goodness, such a busy week. I don't know when I'm going to have time. But so she was looking around the room and I went back to the, to the storage room and I took a copy of Picnic Spot and I added snow. I put snow on the grass. I used a fan brush. I put snow on the trees and turned it into a winter painting. And I came back and I said, well, this is what I have so far. What do you think? And she loved it. And so uh, that one we call winter holiday. And we teach that all the time in the winter. But all it required was adding white snow. Uh, so I have to snicker every time I see this painting. Usually we come up with something brand new. But the second week of December can be pretty busy around here. So I have lots of pastel colors going across. Um, blue and white. And I toned down that red so now I pink. And then where they mix, I have a pretty lavender, which I'm, I'm happy with. I like that. And again, I'm going to go ahead and show you the next step, but if you're not there yet, don't worry at all. Don't worry at all. I'm going to, on one side of my brush, up a little bit of some of the white, and then the other, pick up a little bit of yellow, just a little. And then wherever I want to, I'm going to streak in some yellow and white too, only because the original has it in there. If you don't want to add another color, don't, but it's up to you. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how much how much you missed uh, when my phone cut out. I'm so sorry. It looks like I'll we're just on the same page. Go ahead. I said, it looks like we're on the same page. We're in the, near the same spot. Okay, good, good. So basically, um, just to recap, I went through with the blue and white and then a little bit of water and toned it down. Then I had my red and white. Uh, and then toned it down with a little water. And then I took my yellow and white and toned it down with a little water. And the great thing about acrylic paint, it can paint over. Um, you just have to let it dry. But I love that about acrylic paint. Um, we have boss classes here. Obviously, it's not a boss class. Those are oils. And you can't, you can't paint on top of oils without really changing what you're doing. Um, they blends that way. Those are for blend, but you can't let it dry and then on top it stays for years. So acrylic is so fast. It's really, really kind of nice that way. So I'm looking at the rise in line and it's about two thirds of the way down. I'm pretty happy with my Background colors and how far they're going down now, they're going to be just fine, absolutely fine. And so I have to make a decision. I can put in my river first or creek, and actually there's some over here too, so there's like these islands of green. I can put in the land first or I can put in the water first. It doesn't really make any difference, but I think it's going to be easier for me to put in my water first. So I'm going to pick up my medium brush and again your brushes look a little bit different than mine. If your large brush is better for this task, you know, just kind of figure that out as you go. I'm going to draw a line where I want my water to start. It's about two-thirds of the way down the canvas 
and that's this area right here. And I'm making a vertical line with my medium brush holding it flat. Then I'm just gonna use the sides of my medium brush to just sketch on where this creek is gonna go. And it goes about two inches up on the side here, on the left side, and then it curves. Make sure, make sure creeks or rivers always curve. Never do a straight line, or then it's hard to convince your viewer that it's a creek or a river. Curves, curves, curves. Anytime you're doing water, the contour of it should be curvy. Not the waves, not the water, but the contour of the land and the water. Okay, and then over here on the left side, I'm going to curve and then go up because my green is going to be right in there. And then down here, I'm going to go up about another two inches. I'm going to start and then I'm going to pull it down and I curve the line there. I could, if I could go up a little higher, but if I did go up higher, I have to make this land, the horizon line a little narrower up there. I want it to look like water is coming from this direction and this direction. And as if that weren't enough, I've got another little puddle or pond on this side, which is, looks like a bowl of soup. And then land is going to go here, land is going to go there, and land is going to go there. But here's the thing. No, no one's ever going to see your, the original, so you put it wherever you want. This is just where I'm going to do it. So here's the thing about painting water. If you are in a boat and you look down, and you look out two or three feet from the boat, or even five or 10 feet from the boat, water looks like this when you're looking right down on it. And that's how most people paint water. But when you're looking at a creek from a distance, this might be 50 feet away, this might be 100 feet away, and definitely when you're painting oceans and lakes, you wanna make the water as flat as possible. That is more convincing to your eye. So we're gonna keep our brush flat, flat like it's laying on the table like a knife flat, and go side to side. I'm painting side to side with the flat sharp part. And I'm just gonna put in my water, just being real careful, just painting it in with sideways vertical strokes as flat as I can. The way we make waves or splashes is just by white because water, uh, sunlight hits water when, when it's splashing and then it just makes white ripples. And that's how we'll show that the water is moving, but we're not gonna do those scoopy, those are like cartoony. So we're not gonna do any cartoons, we're just gonna Paint our water flat and then come in later and put in some white ripples to show some movement. And, you know, <clears throat> most people have a hard time painting perfectly flat anyway. And so the amount of mistake that you make when you're trying to be flat is just enough to show that the water is not perfectly flat. So by trying to be flat, It'll be perfect because no one can do it perfectly flat. And then don't forget to get the sides as well. And when this dries, I'm also going to put it on the bottom. I'm going to keep painting around just like I wrap the painting around the wooden frame. And the longer and the smoother and the flatter your strokes, the more your water will look convincing.
I've seen so many people paint really beautiful paintings and they put those cartoony waves in and then suddenly it doesn't look real anymore. This is a fairly realistic painting. Did you have a question? Yes, did you paint your blue and black together? I mean, mix the blue and black together? Um, no, is yours not this bright, not this dark? No. Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, it's not that dark. So the two things, one, I'm looking at the camera and it does look darker on the camera than it does in real life. Um, in real life, it looks like a meat, like a, a royal blue. Yeah. And on awesome. the camera, on the camera, it looks navy. In our paint kits that we sell, we actually put in ultramarine blue, and the, um, which may be a little bit lighter anyway. And the reason we do that is that if somebody want, like if you wanted purple in your sky, the lavender, if we didn't, let me rephrase that. The ultramarine blue is a good mixing blue that um, will help you make pretty much any color. So it's what we put in our paint kits. And I might, we have about, uh, about 10 different kinds of blue here. I might have grabbed a different blue that's slightly different than your ultramarine. But the ultramarine, I love the ultramarine. It's got a little purple hue to it. It's a warm blue. And I think your paintings go look really pretty. You. When we add white to the water, it's going to light, mine's going to get a lot lighter. And in fact, I don't even have to clean my brush. I can just go into the sides of the white, hold it flat, make sure you always hold it flat, and then I can just streak in some water lines to make my water more convincing. They don't have to be perfect lines, perfect stripes. In fact, the, the less perfect they look, the better. Because water is, nature is not perfect. Did that lighten it up quite a bit? Or somewhat? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks, that was a great question. I forgot that you had ultramarine blue. That's, we used to put phthalo blue in our kits, and then um, we wanted to make sure all the kits were the same because it's hard to keep track of, you know, when you have 30 classes a, a month. But people were having a hard time. The phthalo blue didn't mix well with red to make purple, and it just made it gray. So we found that when we used the ultramarine blue, pretty much all the mixing looked good. But it does make for a more purpley blue painting. All right, and I'm going to add a little extra white just in the center because that's more of my focal point. So I want people to see the center more than the sides. So a little bit extra just right in the center. Keep it so that you do have these streaks though. Don't blend it all in because it's the streaks that say, I'm moving water. This is water moving. You could also use your baby brush if that's easier. Whatever brush is easier for these white streaks, you can see the baby brush does really well for the white streaks. So whatever brush feels more comfortable to you, if you use a bigger brush, you just have to hold it on its side, on the flat side, to get those fine lines. If you hold it on the broad side, it, like here's the broad side, right? If you hold your brush on the broad side, you're not gonna get any fine lines. You're gonna get those fat lines. We wanna hold it on the flat side, like it's a knife laying on the table. We want this to be what we're painting with. It's a nice fine line. And that makes those, those nice water lines.
I'm gonna push that back a little bit so I can get the whole thing in there. Maybe. When you have a bunch of black water lines in, I'm sorry, white water lines, then I'm gonna take my baby brush. I did clean the white off of it. And I'm just going to scribble with just little back and forth lines and skipping some areas along the edges of this to kind of break up that original blue line because unless it's a man-made body of water, it's not gonna have a hard and fast blue line. I'm just kind of breaking it up a little bit on the sides and that adds a little shadow in it too. Don't overdo it. It's the tiniest amount of paint, but it's just adding a little bit of shadow on the side. And I'm just doing it right at the, where the water, I'm being messy about it, right where the water meets the the edge. Just a little scribble, not much paint. Just kind of defines it without being a straight line. A straight line wouldn't look right. It would look like just too artificial. So baby brush and just the teeniest amount of scribble, just where we're going to be putting in our land. This kind of breaks up that water a bit, that edge. And adds a little bit of shadow on the side. Don't overdo that step. And then I put my brush in the water and I'm letting it dry. I can see on this painting actually, it also has a little bit of those, I, I just took my brush out of the water and I didn't put any paint on it. It was just still kind of dirty. So with about what a flea would track in on his shoes, if a flea had shoes, I'm just gonna really quickly just put a few little streaks of that black on the sides in the water, like that on the left side. And the reason why I'm doing that is again, the focal point is in the center and up, like right in here. And so you want the eye, to, your people, the viewer's eye to go into the painting. So by making the sides a little bit darker in any painting, you pretty much tell the viewer, don't look here, it's dark here. Look, look at the light, go to the light, go to the center. Bob Ross used to do that all the time. If you look at his paintings, he has all kinds of devices in his paintings to get you to look where he tells you to look. By darkness and arrows and it's fun. I could do a whole class on just how he does that. Just a little bit, just a little bit on the sides and scribbly, not a block, not a rectangle, just kind of, scribbly and scribbly. As long as we're on it, I'll give you another little tip. So one thing that makes things look farther away is if they're bluer and lighter. So if I just mix a tiny bit of blue with my brush and a tiny bit of white and make a lighter shade of blue, so far I haven't mixed any. The blue was blue and the white was white. But if I just mix a little bit of a lighter shade of blue and just streak that in back here a little bit, it makes it look like that's farther away because mountains are light blue and skies are light blue 
And if you look at an ocean from a distance, it's very blue. Um, and then when you get closer, then it starts to get darker and more defined. So if you saw mountains up close, they're definitely darker. So I can put in a few just straight on dark ones up here where I'm standing closer to this picnic spot. There's just something to think about when you're painting. Things that are closer are darker and more defined. Things that are farther away are lighter blue. Lighter and bluer and less defined. Kind of fun to play. So I'm gonna just give you some time to work on that. I'm just gonna go grab a water bottle and I will be right back. We're next to a cold stone here and they're torturing me by cooking their cones right now. So everything smells like a big old vanilla cookie. Not fair. I'm just taping on the cord so I don't knock it off. Okay. I put any more tiny white lines back there. I'm just gonna make sure they're super skinny and tiny because I want that to look far away. And then up here they can be big and fat because that's closer. All right, I'm gonna leave that alone, okay? So the grass is gonna be super easy, super easy. I'm gonna use my medium brush for the grass. And this is the easiest thing we've done so far. I'm gonna take a little bit of my blue, sneak it in from the side here, a little bit of my yellow, sneak it in from the side, stir it around, and I'm gonna make, with the yellow and the blue, I'm gonna make a lovely shade of green. And I'm gonna keep going until I have grass green. And here's the thing, I'm not gonna mix it really good. I'm not gonna to try to blend it. I like it streaky on my brush. I don't know if you can see that. It's not mixed really good. And the reason I don't like to mix it too well is that grass is very, it varies in colors. All I have to do is fill this in. Super easy. Um, grass, the color of grass varies in different patches. And so if I don't blend it too well, in some spots it's a little more blue, in some spots it's a little more yellow, and that's going to help it look more realistic. Like, and I'm just dabbing it on, just dab, because grass grows, grows in clumps. And by dabbing it on, I'm getting those clumps. It's looking more rugged. It's not like a golf course. It's, it's more rugged terrain than a golf course. It's a park clumps. So I want it to be clumpy and some of those are 
because I didn't mix it well, some of it looks a little more blue and some of it looks a little more yellow. And that's exactly what I'm going for. And I can even pick up a little more yellow on my, on my brush and I can dab in yellow wherever I want. And if I do that, it just looks like, you know, maybe some parts of it aren't watered as much as the other, you know, maybe the sun's hitting it. It just makes it look a little more natural to have, have it not perfect. So there's blue in there, there's yellow in there. And there's a whole lot of in between. I'm going to do the same thing here, and I'm going to do the same thing in here. Although here, I'm going to go up, I'm going to make a hill, because on this one, it has a hill. So I'm going to not make that flat like I did over here, I'm going to make it a hill. And then I'm going to have fun filling it in with some blue, some yellow, let them dance together and blend together. But in taps. I think this side was a little higher, so I'm going to go a little higher on that one. Tap, tap, tap. Okay, so here's another little trick for you. Anytime something's closer, not only is it darker, but it's also warmer. And what I mean by warmer is warm colors are yellow, red, orange, brown. Those are warm colors. They make you feel warm, like fall colors are definitely warm colors. So when something's farther away, they're bluer. And when something is closer, they're warmer. Blue is a cool color. Blue, purple, black. Those are uh, bluish green. Those are cool colors. And yellow, orange, red, and brown, those are warm colors. So when something's closer to you, it looks warmer. So if you're up in the mountains, if you are looking at the land close up, you'll see a lot of browns and yellows and golds, reds. But then from far away, it looks blue or purple. So in order to make this patch of grass in the bottom right hand corner look closer, I have to make it more yellow or more red or more orange or more brown, something that is warmer and that will help it look closer. So I'm obviously just putting a little bit more yellow in down there. And the ones that are farther apart, like this is far back, it should be a bluer green. This is getting pretty picky, but it's kind of just good stuff to know. And again, they're just dabs, just dabs. Nothing fancy, just pop, 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 dabs. I like to say pop, pop, pop. The closer it is, the more yellow it is. Hopefully you still have some. Well, actually we're fine. At this point, we don't have a lot more to go. Yeah, this is pretty exciting. We're doing great.
I'm just tapping on tiny little yellow pops near the water just to show that that's closer. Maybe there's some little yellow weeds down by the water. I'm just having fun with it. So this painting is kind of interesting in that there's a bush here, but it's very non-distinct, nondescript bush. And basically all she did was she took some of the blue or green and then she just tapped in very loosely some shapes of bush back there. And when I say shapes, I mean like little clumps. If you do them in clumps like this, don't make it too perfect. You don't want it to look like a bunch of triangles, but just little clumps. You can make what looks like little bushes back there. Just little clumps by just tapping in a clumpy shape. So there's one clump, two clumps, three clumps. Don't make them all the same height and width and point or else it'll look like teepees. Just just some random size and shape clumps. And that's how she did her bushes back there. I think there might be one back behind the tree too. If you wanna put one back there, you can, but really we're gonna be covering that with clouds in a minute. Not clouds, sorry, trees. Hello, not clouds. But if you wanna, you can tap one on there and might not see it when we're done, but that's okay. Just kind of adds a little texture. Just holding my brush to the side and just tapping on some little clumps for bushes. And that was just in the plain old green. And then I can put my, <clears throat> my medium brush in the water because I'm not going to use that anymore right now. So far, so good, I think. It's a happy little painting. I think Bob Ross would approve of this little painting. Just got kind of a bit of yellow there. Maybe I could stick in a little more yellow. You don't have to do this. I'm just playing because I'm giving you extra time to do your land. Oh, and I might pull a more yellow. Having time on my hands is a little dangerous. Sometimes I have to tell myself to step away from the canvas. We're going to be putting trees over this anyway. Just a couple minutes, we're going to put some big old trees over that.
I'll give you another minute to finish up on the little bushes and anything else you're doing with your trees. Uh, not with your trees, you're with your land. Tap in a little bit lighter on my bushes since I realized they're pretty dark and I just got done telling you that things were far away or lighter. They're not yellower, so have to be careful. Bluer and lighter. I'm just playing. When you've got your bushes on there and you're 80% happy, and I like to use the term 80% because if you go for 100% happiness on whatever it is you're doing, you'll probably never get there. But if you're 80% happy with it, that's a good place to be. And then you won't try to ruin your 80 by going for the other 20. So if I'm 80% happy, then I know it's time to move on. Excuse me. This ozone in the air makes me cough in the evenings. So I have one tree, two, three, sorry, one tree, two tree, three tree, four tree. Notice that they're all different sizes. These two are very big. This one is also tall, but it starts on a hill, so it's more of a medium sized tree. And this one's smaller. So I want to make sure when I put on my trees, that I have different sizes because in the mountains or in the woods, you will really have different size trees. So I'm going to take my big brush. Your big brush might not be as big as mine, but it doesn't really matter. I could just as easily use my medium. So I have my big brush and I'm tapping into the black. I have it on both sides. I'm not scooping it like ice cream. I just have it on my bristles. And then I'm gonna make one tree here. And instead of pulling down for a trunk, I'm gonna tap on a trunk. And I'll tell you why I'm tapping it on. I don't want it to be perfectly straight. And when I tap, I get these bumps. And that's what I want because a real pine tree would have bumps and scales on it on the trunk. So by making it in taps and not pulling it down, it's forcing that to be bumpy and scaly. And, and I'm overlapping those taps. And then it's also hard to make it a perfectly straight line. And real trees are not a perfectly straight line. They twist and turn according to the soil conditions and who knows what, all kinds of stuff. So that's why I'm tapping it on. And then there's another baby one over here. Make sure you don't have a clump on your, on your uh, brush. And I'm holding it that sharp way. Remember, there's a broad side and a sharp, sharp side. I'm using the sharp side to make this tap. So I've got two trunks, three trunks. And then I'm gonna put another one way over here. But here's the funny thing about this trunk. It's almost off the canvas. And so it's only half on and half off. So that makes it kind of a fun and interesting tree. Now you can do one tree over here or you can add more. It's your, your painting, you decide. I'm gonna copy what she already has pretty close. <clears throat> so I'm gonna to switch to my medium brush for this next step. When, I'll give you a minute to catch up. Notice that tree has a big old bump in it, a knot. That's good. Trees break sometimes. Maybe bears climbed them and they broke and then it had to grow in a different direction. 
The key to a good tree is don't make it perfect. One thing we do want though, is we want the trunks to be bigger at the bottom. So I'm gonna add a few more taps to the side at the bottom because if a trunk isn't wider at the bottom, the tree would fall over when it grows. So we always want the trunk to be a little widest, a little wider at the bottom, and then gradually go up and get thinner as it goes. A little, a little wider at the bottom. And since this one has a tip, I'm gonna make the tip really pointy because a pine tree would have a very pointy tip. That's where the baby branches, the trunk is still growing and the baby branches aren't big enough to stick out. So, so pine trees are very pointy at the top. That's the only one that has a top. This painting is a little bit unusual. It has an even number of trees. Usually when people paint a landscape, they paint an odd number of items. And that <clears throat> when you paint uh, something in nature, if you have odd numbers, it helps your eye um, kind of think about or it signals to your eye this is a natural setting because things aren't symmetrical. So it's a little unusual to have four trees in a painting. Uh, usually I do an odd number, but this isn't my original. Um, and I like the painting, so I'm just gonna do what she did. But if you want to add another one to make it an odd number, feel free. If it were me, I'd put a small tree right here. But you do you. Maybe the picnic spot is right here where there's no tree. Maybe it's here. We don't really know where the picnic spot is. Okay, I'm gonna show you the next step. If you're not there yet, that's okay, but do pay attention. I'm using my medium brush. It's got a sharp side, and it's got a broad side. So I'm going to chisel this brush in my black paint so that I get a nice, flat, sharp side. And then holding it like this, <clears throat> I'm gonna just I'm gonna just use the corner of my medium brush, just the corner, and just get the tiniest little pops at the top of this tree. Tiniest little pops of branches. I don't want it to be the whole thickness of the top of my medium brush because I want the tops of this tree to have baby branches. Then I can reload my brush. And notice how I'm tapping, tap, tap, tap. See how I'm tapping? I'm pushing down harder, and on each side I'm tapping. And I might tap many times on each side. But don't tap it too straight. You want it to, I'm holding my brush flat, and I'm taking turns going from side to side, but I'm also going up and down a bit because I don't want it to look like a ladder. See how I'm going up and down a bit? You see that? Up and down a bit. And then more over the trunk area because 
There are branches that go this way, there are branches that go that way. But there's also branches that come straight out from the front and straight back. So the only way to paint those is to tap over the trunk more than out. So every so often I tap a few more over just the trunk area. But notice how I'm tap, tap, tapping. I'm not just doing one, one stroke, one stroke, one stroke. I'm, I'm tap tapping in a little cluster on each side. And you can have them slant down if you want, or they can slant straight out. There's a million different kinds of trees and there's probably, I don't really know, but there's probably thousands of different kinds of evergreens. I know when I go to Florida, the evergreens look very different than the trees in Colorado. Those look different than the trees in Michigan. One thing that when I'm painting evergreen trees, always make sure that it is a rectangular shape, that you're going out farther as you go from the trunk as you get lower. Because the evergreen trees that I've seen in all those places still have this kind of pyramid shape. It's like a piece of pizza on its crest. And then I also notice that I'm also leaving space between the branches. I want to leave space so the birds can fly in there and build a nest. This is only, and by the way, this was with black paint. I should have said that at first. Uh, I think I did maybe, but um, I'm going to go over this with another color to highlight it. So just keep it not too thick. We don't want it to be this big black pine cone. Keep it thin, keep your paint thin and leave branches in between. Notice again how I'm tapping and at the top, the branches are small, but then as they, as I go down, they're gonna stick out a little bit farther. And I don't have to have the same exact number on, a, of, on each side. Maybe there's a little break in the, in the tree. Maybe, maybe some bear climbed it and broke off a branch or two. It looks more realistic if you don't have it exactly symmetrical. So I want to avoid having everything look exactly the same on both sides. And I want my branches to stick out a little farther as I go down. Every time I come down, they stick out a little bit farther. And tapping, tapping, kind of in this sloppy line that's not a perfectly straight line. Little clusters, little clusters of branches. And then again, remember, go over the trunk area a few more times because those are the branches sticking right straight out at you. So over the trunk, fill it in a tiny bit more. Just whatever you do, don't make it too straight, too perfect. If it starts to look like a ladder, just poke in a few extra little pops in random places. But make sure you're leaving some space. I wanna see some sky in between those branches. We don't want a big old black pyramid there. Wouldn't make any sense. <clears throat> the other thing is, when you have a evergreen in your yard, you mow the bottom, you have to trim the bottom of the tree to mow underneath it. And when you buy a Christmas tree, they, they trim off the bottom branches so that they can cut the tree down. And in a city park, they mow underneath it so they take up the bottom branches. In the woods, in the mountains, they don't, right? It's natural. So the branches go all the way down to the top of the grass normally in nature. So if you have a little, you know, trunk at the bottom just sticking out, it's not really natural. So bring your branches all the way down if you want it to look like a natural setting. Because the grass grows up to the bottom level of the branches. Again, starting at the top, making a little pyramid, little smaller, smaller branches at the top always in order to get farther out as I go down.
And this takes a while, so just take your time. Again, always leave spaces in between the branches. We want the birds to be able to come in and build the nest. If you put a little bit more pressure toward the trunk on the, when you're doing the area over the trunk and then a little less pressure when you come out to the tips, you'll have a nicely shaped branch. It'll be thicker near the trunk. That's kind of hard to do. But a little more pressure at the trunk and then a little lighter touch at the ends will give you a pointy branch. And I'm just taking my time. Now our trees aren't going to stay black. We're going to have to let those dry and then we'll put some highlights on. I visited this really wonderful painter in Florida when I was down there at the Bob Ross workshop and I went to this <clears throat> community center where they're teaching art and this really amazing landscape artist was showing his work and I was talking to him and he he had a problem with Bob Ross he he said well I've never seen a real black tree in nature so therefore he didn't think much of Bob Ross but you know what Bob Ross never left a tree black he started black because that was the shadow underneath the branches and behind the branches, and then he would always highlight them. As a certified Bob Ross instructor, I know because I've watched a lot of Bob Ross. And then tap more on over the trunk area. And these branches are just hanging right out over the river. So take your time. You're going to be, I'm not going to, I'm going to be faster than you, but just take your time. I've got three trees done, but you might still be on one. Whatever, wherever you're at, that's fine. I'm working on my fourth. And so this one only has half a tree, which is kind of kind of fun to do. But I am going to continue the paint on the side because I want the painting to continue over. So I am going to paint the branches on the other side by doing that. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. When it's all black like this, it reminds me of tarantula legs. And then when I've got my branches on, I'm going to put my brush in the water. I'm going to let it dry. Like I said, we're going to be putting on some highlights on our trees, but not in black. So I'm going to let my brush take a soak in the hot tub and then I'll clean it real well before I come back. I was going to say, you know, before you do, if you still have a little bit of black on your brush when you're done, you can always put a little bit more of that scratch, scratchy, shadowy in here at the base of your river if you want. We kind of wiped out some of it when I put in grass, but that's easy to overdo it. I don't like to overdo it, so if you don't do that, that's fine too. And then in the water. So far, so good.
So I'm going to give you plenty of time to tweak your trees, but here's the thing. Maybe you, um, uh, when you're, it's a good thing when you're painting with someone else, you can ask them for their opinion in a nice way, of course. Make sure that your trees are, have this triangular shape, like an arrow, okay? An arrow pointing up, so make sure that's happening. Make sure that, <clears throat> so your branches stick out more at the bottom and get skin, you know, tighter as you go up. Make sure there's a point on the end of any small trees because that's where the new baby branches are growing. Make sure that you don't, you, you, sorry, let me rephrase. Make sure that you do have sky showing between the branches. Don't make it so thick that you can't see the sky between the branches. And then if you can see your trunk really well, the shape of your trunk, pop some more paint just over the branch, over the trunk part, more at the bottom, of course, and because <clears throat> you want to disguise that trunk a little bit because remember their branches popping forward that you can only paint by going over the trunk area. And they're also branches going backward. They go in four directions, out, back, side, side. So the way you paint the ones coming forward is by tapping over the trunk area. That area should be a little bit denser. That's the word I like, dense. Just over the trunk area. So I'm just gonna give you time to work on the trees some more, but don't use the extra time to fill in the spaces between the branches. If you finish and you're 80% happy, don't keep painting, walk away. Go, go look at your painting from 20 feet away. I always recommend looking at your painting from 20 feet away. Here's my philosophy. I raised three teenagers. My as a parent, you have to, parenting is hard work. You have to get away from your kids and take a breath from a little distance. And then you can see them for who they really are and come back them and love them even more. Kids tell me, kids in my classes tell me it's the same thing about parents. It's the same thing about painting. If you've been staring at a painting an hour or two or however long, you can't really see it for what it is. You have to walk away and look at it from 10, 20 feet away Look at it, think of it, uh, think about it, see if there's anything you want to tweak or change, or maybe you'll just appreciate it. And, and then when you come back, you'll, you'll know what's next. So do get up, look at your painting from far away across the room. The other thing is people aren't gonna come into your house and put their nose in your painting. They're not, they're not gonna do this. Oh, look, she missed his spot. No, they're gonna look at your painting from, 10, 20 feet away across the room, and they're gonna think you're a genius. So you wanna see what other people are gonna see. So step back, take your time, look at what you're doing. I always recommend doing that probably every 15 minutes, 20 minutes when you paint. So if you haven't done that yet, please do that. And so I'm gonna give you a little time to work on that to uh, finish your trees and get up, look at your painting from across the room. When we come back, we're gonna highlight our trees, we're gonna stick in a little bit of shadow, and then we're gonna sign our name. Woohoo! Pretty exciting.
I was just thinking about this painting with all those pretty streaks of color in the background. I was thinking, I wonder if there's northern lights in the summer. I don't really know. <clears throat> but maybe that's what she was going for. Sometimes it's hard to know. And sometimes it doesn't matter. I do want to show you something. I'm going to take my baby brush. A little bit of red, just a little bit of red couple ladybugs worth and I'm going to mix it into a little bit of my blue sorry my green not blue I want to have if you mix red and green you'll get brown so I just want to just a little bit of green with a little bit of red to make brown and look I always had a hard time remembering what is it that you make brown and then someone explained to me basically it's <clears throat> two colors that are opposite of each other on the color wheel and so if you don't have a color wheel handy that's hard to remember too so basically one secondary color like green that it's secondary because red because yellow and blue make green so when you have to combine two to make one color that's a secondary color and one primary color when you mix them together they make brown so the best way for me to remember that is Christmas brown Basically, if I mix a little red and a little green, I will always get brown. That's a good way to do it. So I made just the tiniest amount of brown by mixing a little red and a little green. And in this painting, she just has some little bit of brown just kind of scribbled, just scribbled at the base of these bushes. And it's really just a scribble. Because if you, if you make it too straight or overdo it, it won't look natural. It's just like a little, I don't know, some kind of foliage back there or shadow or something. And then she put a little bit of it under each tree as well. Maybe it's the dead grass that, you know, because there's no sun under there. We don't really know what it is for sure. Probably a shadow. So just a little scribble, just the tiniest amount under each tree in a scribble, not a straight line, a scribble. And that just gives it a little, little more realistic, you know, additional color back there. <clears throat> and it's not a lot, it's really not a lot. Just a little scribble, just a scribble. I have to know what something is for it to look good. I'm going to go ahead and show you the step, but if you're still working on your trees, I understand. Okay, so I'm going to ignore that brown, okay? What I am going to do though is I'm going to take my clean medium brush, I have to clean it first, and then I'm going to mix together a whole bunch more green. There's my yellow, and there's my blue, a whole bunch more green. 
whole bunch more green. And I want it a little on the lighter side. And again, I'm not going to perfectly stir it around till it's perfect. If it's got these little stripes in it like a watermelon, that's even better. Then I'm going to take my medium brush, okay? And then just like I did the branches before, I'm going to pop on new ones with green. But here's the catch. This is my highlight color. So I don't want as many of these as I did black branches. I'm not going to go exactly over top them because this is just the ones that are catching the sunlight. It's a highlight color. So don't do as many as you did before. This, this step should be a lot quicker because it's just a little bit, okay? And my branches are gonna stick out a little farther in the green than they did in the black. Why? Because this is the highlight color. So the sun is kissing the tips of each branch. So it's making them brighter green at the tips. So you show that by just having your branches come out a little bit farther with the bright green. And that shows that the light from the background, whether that's the sun, the setting sun, or who knows. Maybe there's already a sun and a moon. Sometimes the sun and the moon are out at the same time. But anyway, I'm gonna make that effect with just the green coming out a little bit farther at the tips than it did with the black. And don't don't fuss. Don't take you know. Don't worry about it being on top of all your black. This is another layer, just a second layer, and it's the highlight layer. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just kind of a little more random than the black. And don't call, cover your black. Again, I'm a Bob Ross instructor here, so I use a lot of his quotes when I paint. Bob used to say that you have to have dark to see the light which I think is a wonderful metaphor for life. Kind of helps me not get depressed during this pandemic. Do you remember that? You have to have dark to see the light. And so you have to have the background of your trees, the black of your trees to show up so that it highlights the highlights. It gives the, the highlights something to cling to and to contrast against. So by having the black behind it, both are more beautiful. <clears throat> it's the same step, holding the brush in the flat way. So I get these skinny lines and then coming down just like I did when I painted the tree with black. I'm just using less pressure now and coming out a little bit farther than each branch did in the black. And that just makes my, my trees pop. They, they're standing at attention now. Before they were just taking a nap. And like I said, it, um, since we're doing this on Zoom, if you have any questions, don't, don't be afraid to unmute yourself and ask me, ask me questions. And then don't forget to get the sides of the painting too. So that painting just wraps all the way around. Now those trees are happy. They have dimension. That's how you make happy trees.
I have to say this because I am Rob Ross certified. This is not a Bob Ross painting. I do refer to him. This is acrylic paints. I've only painted in oils. We do teach Bob Ross oil classes here at the studio, but we are not doing it during the pandemic because they're long and they take hours and we are sticking to shorter classes during the pandemic. So when the pandemic's over, we'll go back to teaching Bob Ross in studio. I can't wait because I really love those classes. And I hope someday you'll join me for one. One of these days I'm gonna do one online too. I just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. All right, always popping a little bit more over the trunk. And then I'm gonna leave it alone. <clears throat> so the very end of the painting, it's very tempting to say, oh, you know what looked good in here? A crocodile. Or why don't I put a cabin? Or I'm going to add, you know, X, Y, Z, you name it, a, a John Deere tractor, whatever. I want to encourage you to resist the urge to totally change your painting at the very end, because I have seen many paintings run that way. But you do you. I think I am going to call my painting finished, and I'm going to dip my brush, my me, uh, sorry, my baby brush into the red paint, you could use any color. I'm just gonna put my initial in the bottom right-hand corner. You can put it anywhere, but that's a good place for it. <coughs> oh, I just missed, messed it up. I have to do that again. You could do it in any color you like. Pretty sad when you mess up your own initial. Doesn't matter, anyway. This one's going on the sale table anyway. <clears throat> but that's it. That is, that is it for me. So just finish at your own, your own pace. And it's been a pleasure painting with you today. I just told you not to resist to resist the urge, but dang, that pink is pretty. I'm gonna try to brush that out with just water. See what I get. I gotta step away. I have to tell myself to step away because I could tweak and play with the painting until it's a completely different painting, and then I'm sorry. So. After I put some water in this, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna slap my own hand and I'm gonna walk away. I just noticed when I was 10 feet away that mine was a little duller than the original. And that just, just adding a tiny streak of pink will brighten it up a little bit, but it's really easy to overdo it or to make mistakes after you're happy. So as soon as I get a little more water on there, I'm gonna slap my hand and walk away and I'm just gonna, be glad I'm done. And I hope, I hope that you've enjoyed painting this painting with me today called Picnic Spot. And then it's kind of funny if you ever want to come in and paint with me again or paint with me on Zoom, we'll be doing the same painting and adding snow to it at the end. <laughs> That'll be called Winter Holiday. <laughs>